as well. May angels and men rejoice. Alleluia. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. My water. I think uh, Pastor Nate, when he asked me to uh, do the uh, the sunrise service, has this little evil laugh. Ha ha ha! I got him. He's not a morning person. But praise God, the Holy Spirit is here, and he gives us strength. Amen. Amen. The resurrection changes everything. This phrase has uh, kind of shaped the way that I've thought about this morning um, and about life in general. Um, for the last four or five years, it's kind of changed the perspective. Um, uh, you know, when I get into a tough situation, what does that mean that the resurrection changes everything? What does it mean when I uh, go through the joys or the trials or the pains of life? What does that mean? And so uh, some of this was me digging in, uh, and I'm only going to look at a part of what the resurrection means. I think for all eternity, we are going to be exploring what the resurrection means, uh, and uh, we'll be... Uh, impressed and, and blessed throughout eternity to truly understand all that that means. Uh, the verse that kind of our anchor verse, there's so many scriptures after the Gospels that are all about the resurrection. And so this one encompasses, I think, as about as much as I could, could find in the power of the resurrection. This is from Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set all free who have lived their lives slaves to the fear of dying." John MacArthur states, without it, without the resurrection, we have no gospel, we have no salvation, no saving message, and certainly no future. It changes fear into love, despair into joy. The resurrection changes people from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. It changes guilty, condemned people into a celebration of freedom and forgiveness. That is part of the power of the resurrection. As children, I don't know if you, you know, think back. Some of us, it's a little bit longer. We're afraid of the dark, right? Mom, can Dad, can you turn on the light? Uh, I saw something under the bed. Can you look in the closet? Right? There's, there's a natural fear that children have, and some adults as well, uh, fear of the dark. And there is a reason. Um, we live in a, in a dark world where Satan rules the air, the prince of this world. Uh, he is a defeated foe, but he still roars and looks to see whom he may devour. And so there's a natural fear that we have of the dark. And I think this scripture in Hebrews kind of gets at the core of that. Praise God, because of the resurrection, people living in darkness have seen a great light. Where We no longer have to live wandering around, uh, stumbling, tripping over the dark. God is our light, as 1 John 1, 5 states. God is light, and if we walk in the light as He in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sins. Um, I remember growing up, uh, we had a little tape recorder, and I think there was a Sandy Patty song that I would play at night. And until Christ's light would fill me, you know, I had that album, that little tape recorder next to my bed playing. I don't know how many of you others do that with your kids as well, but there's a protection of God's grace. And I think there was also, a, um, um, there was a couple other albums beyond Sandy Patty, but uh, I can't remember those off the top of my head. 
But there's a switch from being afraid of the dark that this scripture talks about as well in Hebrews, that there's afraid of death, there's afraid of dying, there's afraid of judgment and what happens after this life. But because of the resurrection, the dread of death and fear that um, can, um, can stumble us, can capture us, has been defeated. 1 Corinthians 15, we usually read this passage in uh, funeral services, but it is so good for us every day of our lives. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Praise God. The sting of death is sin, right? And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the first point. Uh, God's resurrection changes the power of fear and death and the darkness. Next, uh, the main point we have is the resurrection proves what Jesus said is true. As C.S. Lewis says, either Jesus is a liar, a lunatic, or a Lord. Um, and the resurrection proves he's not a liar. He said he was going to rise again from the dead, and so he did. Two, it says that he's not a lunatic. He did make crazy claims like he was the son of God, right? Yeah. But he rose from the dead, so he's not a lunatic either. So that must mean he's our Lord. So it proves all that he said is true. He said heaven and hell is real. He said there will be eternal rewards and that we don't have to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven here, but we can store up where moth and rust do not destroy. Praise God. But it also means that hell is true, that there is a eternal separation and judgment from God. And that should give us pause, right? Um, we need a Savior. Jesus is the only bridge that can bring us from this earth to heaven. And uh, praise God that we have a defeated foe and um, the hell uh, and death has been conquered. Let me move this down just a tad. Next, the resurrection changes the way that we treat others. Because of the resurrection, we see that people aren't our enemies. Our fight isn't against flesh and blood or principalities and powers of spiritual high places. That's where our battle lies. So we don't have to seek revenge or justice uh, for the wrongs that have been done to us. God took that. He took our own uh, uh, judgment. Because our God is good, He judges uh, sin. He doesn't overlook it. And so only God knows all of the, the depravity that we have in our own thoughts and minds and the depth that we have. Either our sin is covered by Jesus Christ's blood and His sacrifice and death and resurrection, or we're under the wrath of God. And so God extends his mercy to us through Jesus Christ to receive him. Um, when I was thinking about it changes the way that we view other people, it brought back to mind the story of John Perkins, one of the uh, early civil rights leaders, a strong Christian. Uh, he was imprisoned in, I believe, just north of Jackson, Mississippi, and was brutally beaten uh, by the police force. And he, other than the pain that stuck out in his mind, he realized that Satan was destroying his persecutors. And he saw their hate-filled, twisted faces. And in the midst of his pain, he was able to pray for them. He understood that his battle wasn't against these individuals, but it was against powers and principalities and spiritual forces. That's how um, uh, the early... Uh, uh, church father Tertullian said, it's the blood of the martyrs that's the seed of the church. And the reason that that is true is because Jesus rose from the dead. Our next main point is that the resurrection gives us meaning to suffering. Jesus bore our suffering and rose again so that we might have spiritual and physical healing for our souls. 
It can take new meanings. The scripture says, we fill up in ourself the sufferings of Christ. What in the heck does that mean, right? But Paul didn't quite even understand it, but we suffer even as Christ suffered. And it gives a purpose because we have, we have a life beyond this. As Paul states, our persecution, and he had probably more than most, <laughs> beaten, shipwrecked, bitten, all of those things, he says it's light and momentary, our suffering, compared to the suffering of Christ and compared to the joys of heaven. And as we suffer, we can give comfort to others. God never wastes suffering. If you've went through trials, God is going to bring people in your path that you can comfort in a way that Christ comforted you and extend that grace. Amen. And the, um, there's meaning to suffering because we have a life beyond this. There's one day that white man might actually be able to jump. And me and Bear might actually be able to sing, right? Praise God, we get a new body one day. It's light and momentary compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing God. Praise God. Our uh, fifth point, the resurrection gives meaning to our life. It answers all those deep philosophical questions that those egghead philosophers have asked throughout all the ages. Why is there purpose? What is this meaning of life? All of those things. It assures us that there is heaven beyond. Because of the resurrection, Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes aren't ultimately true, where he said, meaningless, meaningless, everything is just a chasing after the wind. That's not true, because there's life everlasting. We have the golden ticket, unlike Willy Wonka, right? Which was the scariest, creepiest movie I ever knew as a kid, right? Uh, Charlie got the golden ticket, which means he ultimately got the factory and the chocolate and, you know, quite a few riches. But ask any businessman, that comes with a lot of stress and uh, um, it's only temporary and all of those people that you have to take care of. But our golden ticket is different. We have uh, eternal um, hope of heaven where every, every tear will be wiped away, where sin and destruction and lockdowns and COVID and wars and politics, praise the Lord, will be no more. And no more goodbyes, right? No more cancer or dementia, deaths of despair, but eternal worship and feasting by the river of life. Amen. Might even be some fish in there. By the crystal sea and a tree that blooms all year round uh, for the healing of the nations. Amen. And our final point is the resurrection leads us to worship. Amen. Ultimately, Jesus is worthy of it all. Heaven and, and all the angels and the earth declare the glory of God. It says that the earth right now groans under the weight of sin, but there'll be a time that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and the new heaven will come down. And uh, there's eternal, um, there's no eternal goodbyes. There's no darkness anymore. Praise God. And as I close, I want to, share two stories of two little boys um, that will drive home how much Christ loves us, especially if you struggle with that. The first little boy is me at six years old. My uh, brother's Cub Scout troop, which my mom was a part of the leadership uh, of that, which I wasn't old enough to be in, decided to take a hike down the Gali River and see the whitewater uh, um, Rapids and the, and the rafters that were going down the Class 5, one of the strongest rapids in, uh, in the East Coast, um, Pillow Rock just above. It's a very dangerous section, even with a professional rafting boats with life vests. Well, I stepped on a slick rock, and in I went, and without even thinking, uh, well, my mom yelled at the scout, the Cub Scout master, do you swim? No, I don't swim. I said I don't swim. And without even thinking, mom jumped in with
without ever thinking what the rest of the family would think. And somehow, by God's grace, got in front of me and uh, got my head above water and got me to the other side. And I think God sent two kayakers because they got us from one side of the river to the other after I spit up water and stuff like that. And, uh, and we turned around to thank them and the kayakers were gone. Either they were very quick or the, the Lord sent some angels. And, um, and at that same time, two of the older boys, barefoot, ran all the way back up to the top of the mountain uh, to call 911. And about halfway up, uh, two stretchers were coming down, and they stood in awe, wondering, how are you alive? Uh, we really thought that we'd be picking up two bodies down at Swiss, eight miles down. Um, it's, uh, it was high tide. And uh, the next story is a young boy who, uh, on a hot day in Florida, decided to go for a swim in the pond behind their house. His mom would always tell him, be very careful, make sure I'm looking when you ever go in. And uh, this particular day, he, he shucked his shirts and uh, his socks and shoes and, and just took off and jumped off the dock and got about halfway through and mom looked out the, the window of the kitchen and for, to her horror, she saw an alligator swimming towards her son and she started screaming and the boy heard and turned back but uh, by the time she ran down and he got to the dock and at the same time she grabbed his arms and the alligator grabbed his feet and there was an epic tug of war and as much as the alligator struggled the mom would not let go and she's screaming and um, a farmer comes by and hears the screaming, sees what's going on, grabs a gun that he has in his truck, goes down, takes aim, shoots the alligator, and is able to rescue the boy. And after several weeks in the hospital, um, the boy uh, survives, and the news reporter comes and asks, can I see your scars? And uh, he uh, pulls up you know, his pant legs and shows these terrible scars on his legs. He said, but with obvious pride, let me show you my arms. And he, he pulls up his sleeves and he said, that's where the deep uh, marks in my arms were from my mom's nails that would not let me go. And we have a savior in heaven with scars in his hands and nail prints in his feet that has scars in heaven because he would not let us go. No matter what, Christ will not let us go. The resurrection changes everything. Jesus, we thank you that your scars were for our rescue, that you would not let us go even though we wanted to run away from you, even though we um, were sinners, you died for us even while we were in the midst of it. And your grace will not let us go. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that sin and death and darkness has been defeated. Thank you that you are our Savior and our Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us go out in celebration outside. Uh, there's a song sheet, uh, if you'd like, on the way out. And... Uh,